Hi, everyone. I guess we, I hope we are live on Zoom. Uh, welcome so much. My name is Deb Schrager. I'm the director of the Springboard Institute here at Georgetown Law. And I'd like every, to welcome everyone who's here in the courtroom and watching this program virtually. The Springboard Institute is honored to co sponsor this program with the South Asian Bar Association of DC. Uh, the Law, South Asian Law Students Association and the Dharma Law Student Association. Founded almost 25 years ago, the Supreme Court Institute is best known for our report program, which taps into the expertise of faculty and outside practitioners to prepare counsel for oral argument before the Supreme Court. SE offer, SEI offers its reports as a public service and at no charge and irrespective of positions taken by counsel, reflecting a core commitment to the quality of Supreme Court advocacy in all cases. We also sponsor educational programs such as this one, focusing on the Supreme Court, uh, the work of the Supreme Court and cases of the court past and present. I would like to thank this very distinguished panel. I realize I'm not standing that far enough to be seen. I just realized that. I apologize virtually on Zoom. Uh, as I was saying, I would like to thank this distinguished panel for participating in this event and also thank SEI Assistant Director Cal Boldy and Georgetown Law Event Coordinator Claire Sanfilippo for their invaluable help handling many logistics. Just a small bit of housekeeping. I would like to remind everyone in the courtroom that this event is being live streamed on Zoom and we will post a recording of the program on the Law School's YouTube channel. I also ask that you refrain from eating and drinking anything other than bottled, bottled water while you're in the courtroom. We like to protect this carpet. Um, I am now pleased to introduce our moderator for tonight's program, especially pleased because he is a JD candidate here in, at Georgetown Law Center. Ashwin Ramaswamy, I hope I said that right, close yeah. enough, is, the John, is from John's Creek, Georgia and holds a BS in computer science from Stanford University. He works at the intersection of technology, law, and policy, and his interests include digital humanities, religion, and spirituality, and the South Asian American experience. At Georgetown, he is president of the Dharmic Law Student Association, which comprises students from the Dharmic traditions, religious, spiritual, and philosophical traditions that are centered around the concept of Dharma including, but not limited to, Buddhist, Hindu, Jang, and Sikh traditions. Equally impressive is that this program is happening completely at Ashwin's initiative and leadership, which is no small feat for a busy law student. When he asked an SEI who would help host the event, it was an immediate yes. I am personally grateful to have played a small part in facilitating this important conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I very much appreciate all the support that SEI has given um, to make this event a reality, in addition to uh, Salva DC as well, um, and also um, you know the, the student orgs uh, Salsa and Dalsa as well. Um, in this event, would have been, would have been possible without um, all of you. So I'm going to start with a quick introduction to uh, who and what we're talking about, um, and then introduce our panelists here. So. Uh, we're talking about um, Bhagat, Dr. Bhagat Singh Din um, and his story. Um, 100 years ago, in 1923, the Supreme Court took away American citizenship from an extra extraordinary man named Dr. Bhagat Singh Din. He was many things, a Sikh American, a UC Berkeley graduate, an independence <laughs> activist for India, and also an American war veteran. He still had his citizenship revoked uh, by the Supreme Court. And this is because at the time, American naturalization law only allowed three white persons, whatever that means, uh, and those of African ancestry to become citizens. But what about Asians and Indians? Are, are they, were they white, black, or neither? Uh, they didn't really fit into this whole uh, dichotomy. So that's, that's what we'll be talking about today. And the implications of that case 100 years later for how we think about uh, what um, everything we're working for, whether um, you know debates on race, caste, what's the role of spirituality and religion um, and politics and all of those things. So 
uh, I will introduce our distinguished panelists here. Uh, so first introduce um, Mr. Uh, Sim J. Singh uh, Atariwala. He's the Senior Manager of Policy and Advocacy at the Seed Coalition. His work focuses on uh, grassroots and national advocacy against uh, various issues such as hate crime, uh, workplace discrimination, and racial profiling. Um, he has testified in Congress, quoted in various publications, and presented remarks in national conferences around the issues which he and his organization advocate for. From. He's also a, a graduate of Georgetown Law. He holds his master's in law from Georgetown. Um, and he also uh, is an active member of the South Asian Bar Association of Washington, D.C. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Ashwin. Yeah. The next panelist is Professor Shirali Munchi. She's professor of law at Georgetown University. Um, she earned, earned her JD from Harvard Law School and a PhD in literature from Columbia University. Professor Munchi has studied and, and done a lot of scholarly work on Thin, in this case extensively, and has an article on the contemporary relevance of Thin in, in the Ethnic Studies Review. Her areas of scholarly interests include property law, immigration law, and critical legal theory. Um, her writing has appeared in various places, such as the Yale Journal of Law of Humanities, the American Journal of Comparative Law, and Harper's as well. So thank you for being here, Professor Munchi. Finally, we have uh, Mr. Tejinder Singh. He's a, he's a go-to appellate advocate for plaintiff, plaintiffs, including various folks, including whistleblowers, victims of terrorist attacks, uh, and civil rights, uh, victims of civil rights violations. Um, he's done, before joining Sparacino PLLC, where he is now, he was a partner at the elite Supreme Court appellate, ad, appellate litigation boutique, Goldstein and Russell PC. He made history as the first turban Sikh to ever argue a case before the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, in fact, he's just finished arguing the Supreme Court case yesterday. Mm -hmm. and, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's also developed a very deep understanding of the law. And I've heard that uh, Supreme Court Justice Lena Kagan has described him as an awesome lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. All right. So, I think uh, let's get started. So I wanted to see if we could first start with a um, just an introduction as to what, what is the whole case about? What was kind of the, the main issue of the case uh, before we start you know, digging deeper into it? I was wondering if Professor Bunchi, if you could pop sure. it into that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So this case, the Bhagat Singh Klan versus the United States was decided in 1923. So at that time, um, the question that the court had put before itself was whether um, the court's language, a high caste Hindu from Punjab, um, was racially eligible for citizenship, right? Because this uh, citizenship at the time was restricted to free white people. So the Naturalization Act of 1790, one of the first, you know, first acts of a revolutionary Congress was to restrict citizenship to white people, right? Um, after the Civil War, Reconstruction, that language was amended to extend citizenship to emancipated Africans. So it was it, it, uh, it, the language of that uh, restriction was amended to embrace descendants, African, African Americans and descendants from uh, of African Americans, something like that, right? But the point is that that language was um, adopted, right? Explicitly to ex exclude Asians from citizenship rather than simply strike out the racial qualification for citizenship, right? The purpose was to sort of exclude Asians from citizenship. But the Naturalization Act uh, posed relatively few hurdles to immigration until um, the turn of the 20th century, when a greater diversity of immigrants were coming to the US from, you know, the sort of darker parts of Europe, and also Asia and Arabia. And then under the pressure from various labor unions and others, courts started adopting a more restrictive interpretation of white, right? So the, before then, a lot of Indians had been naturalized, actually, right? The naturalization act didn't present any barrier, right? But, you know, during this kind of moment of heightened nativism, courts are adopting a more restrictive interpretation of white. So before it then comes before the Supreme Court, uh, before the, the Supreme Court, um, the Supreme Court also decides another case involving a Japanese immigrant, immigrant named Kyle Ozawa. Okay, and this 
this particular fellow, right, was arguing that he was qualified for citizenship because actually his skin looked relatively white, right? If you, he said, if you sort of lift the sleeves of my, of my jacket, you'll see that my skin is relatively white. But the court rejected this argument instead of appealing to a kind of racial scientific language um, and argued that, you know, what we mean by free white people are Caucasians, okay? So then Pin <laughs> came along and said, actually, under race science, you know, evolving race science, I am from the Caucasus, descended from the same places as European, you know, Europeans in the United States. And then at that point, the court um, rejected the argument, clarified its holding to say, what we mean by Caucasian is what the average well-informed white American means by Caucasian, right? So part of what's astonishing about this decision is that the average well-informed American becomes invested with this power to determine membership, right? Citizenship and belonging within, within a kind of national family. Um, and so, you know, so this is so so this is what the case has largely come to stand for, I think, the racial inscription of difference, right? When it comes to the Japanese, Indians, but perhaps Asian more broadly, right? And the, the racial disqualification um, from citizenship, right? I think we can complicate that narrative, right? But that is um, what the case, I think what the case, the language of the case does. That's great. And, and uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say that that's exactly right. The really fun part of the case, I think, is when in Ozawa, you know, the court says, I actually love the actual language. You know, they say manifestly, the test afforded by the mere color of skin is impractical because it differs greatly among persons of the same race, even among Anglo Saxons ranging by imperceptible gradations from the fair blonde to the swarthy brunette, the latter being darker than many of the lighter hued persons of the brown or yellow races. You know, so that, like, there's this whole description, like you can't tell by looking, you know, you gotta go, gotta go a little deeper. And then uh, when someone says, okay, I look deeper, it turns out I'm white. They're like, no, no, we looked at you. <laughs> you know, definitely not. Um, and so it's a nice, it's an interesting flip-flop uh, that sort of draws into focus what's going on. And another interesting fact is that both of the decisions are written by the same justice, uh, George Sutherland, who had just been appointed to the court and who was himself actually an immigrant. He was born in England. Um, so that's, uh, you know, nice move from the fellow. Yeah, I was curious, Mr. Singh, if you could talk more about um, about the composition of the court at the time there was Sutherland there was Taft how did how did that kind of affect how the court thought of things and maybe you know how, how is what they did there still maybe good law today and how does that affect how we still think about you know legal categories today sure so the Taft court was it's, it's actually a pretty interesting time in the court's history uh the chief justice was Taft um and Sutherland uh was newly appointed along with a few others who uh, there were four justices, quite conservative, who came to be known as the Four Horsemen, and what they became famous for was striking down New Deal legislation uh, as uh, Democratic administration tried to sort of get the economy on their feet. Um, but uh, at the time, uh, an important fact about how this case arose is it wasn't just the courts adopting more restrictive interpretations. This appeal happened at the behest of the U.S. federal government, the executive branch. So they had said, you, know, you cannot be naturalized. The US District Court actually ruled in Tim's favor, said, yeah, no, that's fine, totally white. Um, and then they appealed to the Ninth Circuit. And then the Ninth Circuit got to certify the question to the Supreme Court. So it wasn't until 1925, a couple of years after this case, that the Supreme Court gained a lot more control over its docket. Uh, through the certiorari process that is now the most common way. You'll often hear about how the Supreme Court only hears a handful of cases. Um, and you know, that process though was not always the case. There were more ways to get a case in the Supreme Court back in the day than there are now. And so one of those ways is that this just got sent up. Um, and so a few things had to happen for the case to get decided the way it did. You know, the executive branch had to take this position. Um, and then you know district court ruled and then they had to appeal. Um, and so these decisions were being made at the highest levels of the executive branch, and then they were getting to the Supreme Court kind of by operation of this process. It's possible that they wouldn't have made it to the Supreme Court later under the certiorari criteria. But then again, if the government wanted it up, it probably would have gone up. Um, in terms of how they're looking at the statute, it's a really interesting question. You know, if you look at what they did, uh, 
they said, when we read statutes, we generally look at what the words meant to the people who enacted them. And I would say that that is still an accurate description of how the Supreme Court mostly does statutory interpretation. They look at the text, they try to figure out the plain meaning in the eyes of the people who enacted it, and then they apply it to the facts that are before them. And candidly, I don't think that they were likely wrong to say, you know, when in 1790 they said free white persons, you know, they didn't mean this guy. Uh, that's probably accurate. Um, maybe they weren't thinking about him, but they probably didn't mean him. Uh, a really interesting contrast point is a, a case that I always think about when I think of this case is this recent decision in Bostock versus Clayton County. So this was about uh, whether Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which among other things prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, also applies to sexual orientation. Right? And Neil Gorsuch wrote this opinion, the gist of which is like, look, I know that in the 1960s, nobody was thinking about this and thinking that they were actually banning discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. But I read the words and they say what they say, and this is how it works and it applies okay, right? And so that's actually an example of a case that goes, that uses very similar uh, principles of statutory interpretation, but comes out flat in the other way, right? You would sort of, like, I actually view the pla the, ar the plaintiff's argument in Bostock as being very similar to the argument that was made in this case, but rejected. And you can ask whether what you're witnessing is an evolution, a more sort of principled approach to statutory interpretation, or what you're witnessing is just a bit of variation in outcomes, because of course, you know, in Bostock, there was a dissenting opinion that were like, no, you know, they weren't thinking about this at the time. So maybe that case is a blip, maybe it's a change, um, but uh, we'd have to wait and see. But I think it's all really interesting because a lot of the same principles are still being applied uh, in kind of similar ways. Makes sense. Um, and uh, Mr. Uh, Audrey, well, I wanted to ask you about, uh, given kind of Thin's experience and, you know, his, uh, with the legal system and, you know, as a Sikh American, I'm curious, how does that transfer to, to maybe to like to how, how, how Sikh Americans uh, operate today in terms of your own advocacy and how you're thinking around those kinds of things? What, what, what can you, what continuities are there? Maybe what, what differences are there? There. Yeah, I think um, similar to Tin's case, he's using the existing legal frameworks and structures to his advantage, right? And so one could argue that he took some pretty bad positions from, um, I guess, a spiritual standpoint, um, you know, trying to argue that he had a repulsion to uh, marriage of a Mongoloid woman to basically appeal to the justices that he um, was, well, what, um, and I don't know if we would agree with that kind of argument in today's environment, if that were to be made, but he was working within the structures that he had. There was no solidarity movements. There was no South Asian Bar Association. There wasn't, there wasn't this kind of infrastructure he could tap into and that he could really fight against the system. So um, what he tried to do is exploit the, the current law using the Ozawa case pretty much to his advantage. And it didn't really work out as I think that they imagined. Um, what's really funny is that Bhagat Singh Tin also served in the U.S. Army as a bearded and turbaned Sikh soldier, and that wasn't an issue back then, but then in the 1980s, um, the Reagan administration decided that religious articles of faith were no longer allowed in the armed services, and so Sikhs were not allowed to serve in uniform with their articles of faith. Um, this also affected Jews, Muslims, many other religious minorities, and we've had to essentially litigate those kinds of issues. And we are still litigating today against the Marine Corps on this very right to allow six to serve in the uniform. Um, the US Army has allowed it after we sued and were successful in that litigation. Um, we continue to see employment discrimination issues. We continue to see um, PPE, for example, has become a hotbed issue for our community where we're not um, allowed to be employed in certain positions because there you can't have a fit seal test for an N95 mask. So doctors, first responders, and the like were basically told to shave their sincere, their, which was a sincerely held religious belief, um, or be fired. So it's really just choose your religion or choose your job. And that's really problematic. And it does just impact six. I mean, we've got racial uh, issues with that as well. There's a painful medical condition that's uh, involved with that that affects a lot of um, Latino and Black men. And so we're accommodating one group of people, but we're not accommodating another group of people who just on the basis of their faith are being told that like, no, you can't do that. 
And so we continue to see these kinds of systems that we have to work in, but um, it's just really interesting that the Bhagat Singh 10 case also shows us that immigration isn't, um, I think, or citizenship is not a concept that we can take for granted. And I'm sure we'll get into that later in the discussion. I don't want to get ahead of that, but I, that, I'll just leave those remarks there. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think just to build on that point, like about citizenship and thinking about colonialism, immigration, how does this all fit in with maybe what was going on at the time? So we know, for example, then was heavily involved in the anti-colonial movement. He was working on behalf of Indian independence. So I was curious if Professor Winchy, you can talk a bit more about that and how that relates to what happened in this case. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, on an occasion like this, where we're sort of um, commemorating the 100 year anniversary of this case, and maybe most of us are sort of lawyers, I think it's, it's important to um, keep in mind or to be sort of like vigilant about what becomes visible through the language of the case itself, which is really limited to the construction of racial legal categories. And I think that's a lot of the way in which this case has been sort of written about with the legal discourse, right? But it's worth recognizing what that project eclipses, right, about this particular history. So a lot of, so as you mentioned, Tim was part of this radical anti-colonial labor movement, anti-colonial anti-capitalist movement. And it was really that radicalism, right? That form of political dissent that brought him to the attention of the federal government and not just the federal government, also British spies, right? Um, who, you know, who recognized the threat that this kind of anti-colonial anti-capitalist radicalism presented to a project of settler colonial capitalism. Right, so just some background here. So Thin came the early, you know, he came uh, 1913, something like that. Um, there's a brief period when group, you know, a few hundred, few thousand um, Indians are coming to the U.S. and they're mostly laborers who are finding work in the West Coast, kind of filling ships' manifests after Chinese exclusion. So right, just doing the work. Um, were doing the work that you know other Asians had been doing before Chinese exclusion, and then a number of them also come as political exiles, already active in an anti-colonial movement, right? And part of what's extraordinary about this Gadda movement is there is this unlikely coalition between these student laborers, or sorry, these laborers and these students, and some of them are student and laborers, like Tin himself. And so, as you mentioned, Tin goes to University of California um, and becomes part of this kind of like group of political, political activists. And what these guys are doing is really synthesizing the kind of anti, a, a kind of anti-racist politics because they recognize that they are subject to racialized discrimination and also a kind of labor politics, right? Recognizing that their colonial status also renders them more vulnerable to um, exploitation, right? And, uh, and so again, so it's it's Thin's involvement in this in this gather movement. He's speaking uh, across the Pacific Northwest, organizing laborers, right? Circulating um, this this uh, it's like a newsletter, the gather newsletter, which circulates all over the British Empire, right? Sounding a call <laughs> for you know embracing a kind of anti-imperial politics, and it's this kind of involvement and in this. Uh, you know, radical heterogeneous movement that really is the menace. It's not his hue, right? So as much as this case is sort of like remembered as a case, I think about his hue, right? I think what's what's worth thinking about is the way in which this kind of anti-colonial politics becomes eclipsed um, by the language of the case, and perhaps like a kind of like anti-racist politics that sort of dominates our um, our thinking about some of these histories now, right? Right. Uh, I think it's also uh, another really interesting part of the case is, um, as Mr. Dr. Well, you mentioned a, a bit about caste, right? So he mentions that he argues he's Caucasian because he's a high caste of full Indian blood and, and there's a pure ancestry in the center. And I think to me, it's just really fascinating how um, basically in American law, we have the idea of caste for over 100 years, like, uh, you know, written into the Supreme Division. So it's it's, you know, as much as it's maybe, you know, a, a concept that we associate with South Asia, it's also very much an American concept and kind of forms the, you know, cornerstone a lot of our law in terms of who is white and who isn't. 
So I'm kind of curious, how is this like relevant to today's state we have today, whether that's, you know, issues to, you know, combat caste discrimination or, you know, issues around uh, racism? How do we kind of think of that legacy when, when, when we're, we're kind of doing the advocacy we need to do today? So I'm wondering if Mr. Adir Bhattam, you can start on your end. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the arguments over race and caste highlight the complex intersectionality, at least for South Asian communities, I think. Um, there's a lot of ways that those categories have been used to, to define and, and marginalize um, certain communities, and that's deeply problematic. Um, and it, I think that the conversation that the, uh, Mr. Singh has, has talked about and Professor Munshi is that there's this reminder here that in the case that the idea of race is um, some people view it as a biological or genetic category, but not under the Supreme Court interpretation of that. They're essentially redefining what it means to be white. Um, and they're using that, it, 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 you know, we saw this in the Ozawa, Ozawa case and the Thin case to, to justify that kind of argument. Um, then also, I think, was the evidence that he was um, part of the gutter party was being used in that case specifically to say that he wasn't allowed to be a citizen. And what's interesting is that the 1906 amendment to the Naturalization Act had changed citizenship to reflect the challenging beliefs of what it meant to really be an American. Um, for the first time, the eligibility actually began dependent on the evaluation of um, an individual's personal beliefs. So um, it's not just residents or willingness to take an oath of citizenship. If you are a pacifist, if you were a conscientious, conscientious objector, an anarchist or a polygamist, um, you basically could not qualify for being a citizen. And I think that the Gunner Party was being used essentially as evidence to preclude him from being a citizen. Um, but what's really interesting, though, is let's look at the opposite side. If he faced deportation, what would happen to this individual? Like many individuals, they would likely face potential execution for their involvement in the Gunner Party, um, because that's pretty treasonous, according to the, the colonial empire. So there was a lot riding on the line for, uh, I think, Thin. And so he had to argue um, to basically avoid death. Overall, I think the, the case documents um, show that social justice and equality in the United States need to continue. Um, and we have to find ways to deconstruct intersecting systems of race and caste and other forms of oppression um, that continue to shape our lives. I mean, we can look at what's happening today, I think, as potential echoes of, of the thin case. After the Thin case, uh, many Indians who gained U.S. citizenship were actually stripped of their citizenship. And um, the Department of Justice then initiated a bunch of denaturalization proceedings against about 69 people, mostly sick men at that time, um, dispossessed them of their land and leases. Um, and what's also just kind of interesting in, in some of the history around this is a lot of Indians at the time married U.S. citizen women. And if their men were um, denaturalized, that meant that also the women were equally impacted and they were rendered stateless. Even though they were born in the United States, they might have been white women, um, it didn't matter. And so we, we've just kind of seen this targeting against the various communities. And today, I think that legacy of insecure citizenship remains alive and well. Um, in the 1946 Lucellar Act, um, you know, we saw the quota of up to 100 Indian immigrants in um, citizenship for resident aliens, and Indians were barred from citizenship unless they were born in the United States, right? In the Obama administration, we saw denaturalization tools, um, and the Trump administration took this to a new level. In 2018, the Department of Justice uh, launched this Operation Janus in second look, and basically targeting South Asians. And when you dig into the case, you see a troubling pattern of immigration officers accusing individuals of um, using their nicknames um, for alleged immigration fraud, which Singapore, a common law's name for six, um, a lot of mix up happened because of the case files not differentiating between people, um, multiple fingerprints being digitized for one person, for example. Um, and it's just kind of, we, we see this pattern and we saw what happened in Operation Janus. They scaled up to 315. 100,000 potential flags, and second look added about over 700,000 flags for individuals for potential um, citizenship revocation or denaturalization process. 
And it, they, it's kind of hard to also just ignore the Muslim ban in 2017, um, where we saw the intersection of race and religion start to impact who was being allowed into this country. And I think it just kind of reaffirms, you know, who do we want to see? Who is considered an American? There's this perpetual foreigner myth within our communities that's deeply troubling. Yeah, well said. <laughs> um, so I want to also, um, I want to ask you, uh, Mr. Tajinder Singh, uh, about, um, you know, thinking like uh, you were the first uh, you know, turban seat to ever argue a case of the Supreme Court. So, so you're very much a trailblazer in many aspects. Um, how is, can you talk a bit more about the kinds of experiences and challenges which you have faced in, you know, in, in the legal profession and maybe how this experience of then does it continue to do that, whether that's what you're facing or you're seeing the community face, whether it's immigration, trying to break into certain kinds of positions. Um, how do you kind of deal with that? Sure. Um, so this is a complicated subject because uh, the issue doesn't only play one way. Um, there is a sense in which I think being a member of a very visible minority group is a, a substantial advantage. Um, you know, if you are good at your job, you are a very memorable face. Uh, and you can uh, leverage that. And uh, you can also help other people very easily just by being good at what you do. Um, it's a it's a wonderful way uh, to lift folks up, even people you've never met. You can you can do them a lot of good just by by doing good work. Uh, in another sense, it's a disadvantage, and especially I think, um, or maybe it's a it's a disadvantage you can turn into an advantage in the field of persuasion. So let me talk about persuasion specifically because that's what as advocates we do. Um, it is almost impossible to get in an argument with a person and change their mind, right? If you and I get in an argument and I say, you are wrong and I am right, and you should believe what I believe and stop believing what you believe, you will likely become defensive, you will stop listening, you will not change your mind, right? The much better way for me to convince you of anything is to actually convince you that what you already believe is in fact what I believe. Right. And so to try and build a base of empathy so that my position feels natural and intuitive to you, not something that I can legend on to you, but something that you embrace and believe you always embrace. Now, this is not easy to do the most. Um, the, and so a lot turns on whether you have a natural foundation for empathy. Right. So I'll take us back a few years. When I was arguing my first Supreme Court case, everyone only really cared what Justice Anthony Kennedy thought, because in any case that was going to be uh, controversial, five to four, he was overwhelmingly likely to be the vote in the middle. And so, like, Kennedy whisperers were the most valuable people in the entire Supreme Court bar. And if you asked me, what does your background and experience do to enable you to persuade Justice Kennedy? The short answer would have been almost nothing, right? There was very little about my life that was similar to his life, other than like we both lived in California and we both did law stuff. Um, you know, there was very little to draw upon. The only thing that I guess I did have to draw upon that maybe other people don't is I had an acute knowledge that I didn't have that foundation and that I would have to build it. Uh, I wouldn't say artificially, but I would say through study and through uh, work, right? It wouldn't flow naturally from my genetics or my upbringing. It would come from trying to do this project quite intentionally. And so when I say it's a disadvantage that can be sort of judo flipped into an advantage, that's what I mean. I think I started at a real natural disadvantage for persuading any member of the Supreme Court that they think what I um, because I did not come from the same high school or the same, you know, general background. I'm the first, uh, you know, first generation immigrant, first person in my family to ever do anything law related. Um, and so for me, it was my awareness of that that gave me the ability to launch a career that made sense. I said, okay, well, now I have to sit down and I have to read everything that you read and I have to learn how to think like you. Um, and in some senses, it's not so terribly different from an effort to pass as white, right? Which was what you saw in 1923, right? Yeah, I'm white. Um, you know, it's not so different. 
right? It is uh, suspend your own upbringing, suspend your own perspective, replace it with the perspective of the person you're attempting to persuade, um, and then see if your arguments work, right? Um, and I think what's a, a nice role that people like us can play is we can act as translators and bridges, right? Just as anyone who is bilingual can uh, take folks who can't communicate and enable them to do so. Uh, and so a lot, I think that a lot of the value we can add is in going out into the world, finding people who could not talk to the Supreme Court and doing it for them because we can understand them and we can understand the justices and we can have both of those conversations. So I tend to view my role as almost like that of a translator um, or a conduit to bring perspectives that I can understand, but the justices cannot, and then cast them in a way that the justices can understand them. Uh, so that's a part of my practice and not just the Supreme Court justices, but like other courts too, right? I work in a bunch of them. Uh, but I think that that's how I would put it, that there is, um, there are ups and downs to this life. Uh, and, but once you understand the project, it's pretty fun. Yes. Wondering if Professor Wenchi, you could also go and talk a bit about your experience in academia, just a bit briefly about how it's been as a South Asian, and, you know. Um, Oh, and you know, it's taking in the place of my employment. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, like, a pleasure I take is teaching students, and I see a lot of my students here, and um, have you know, we were in my first Asian American Studies class. Some of you were here, were in the same class. Um, so I, you know, so part of what I'm interested in with something like this case is introducing students to a history that I know many of us have been starving for. It wasn't until graduate school until I encountered this case. You mentioned it wasn't until relatively recently that you sort of encountered this case. And so I think, um, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's something that I'm interested in doing. And then I just wanted to say also, I think it's worth also as much as we, you know, I think we, we talk about and we can recognize the continuities between um, the persecution that then endured, right? And the through lines to today, right? Um, I think we can recognize, we can recognize some of the ways in which that case remains relevant to the way in which many South Asians, Indians are um, Indian adjacent, right? Or South Asian adjacent are, um, a racialist, right? I think we recognize that. I think it's also worth recognizing how many of us are not entirely the inheritors of BIND or not really the inheritors of a legacy of Asian exclusion, but also the beneficiaries of the Immigration Act of 1965, right? And so we have, you know, this story of my parents' immigration to the U.S. is not one of exclusion, right? It's not one of a racialized exclusion so much as it is selection, right? And I think it's worth recognizing then the ways in which Asian Americans, especially, you know, like those of us who are the children of the 1965 Immigration Act, the way Asian Americans are kind of continuously being repositioned within a kind of ever-shifting landscape of, of racial neoliberalism, right? And I think the, the, what I want my students to appreciate right, is, is, um, is not just the kind of like inheritance of racialization or racial inscription that this case stands for, but like, you know, the, 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 the political excitement that galvanized Finn and, and others of his generation. So part of what was also extraordinary about the Gather movement was drawing lines of connection across, you know, lines of racial difference, right? So um, workers organizing with students, but, um, the Gatherites were involved in many kinds of radical movements taking shape or, you know, learn from and in conversation with Irish Fenians and Mexican revolutionaries and international socialists and so on, right? And drawing lines of connection beyond sort of, you know, categories of race, right? Um, and I think that that is something that I hope, you know, those of us who have been the beneficiaries of the 1965 Immigration Act are kind of aware of, right? And that we have then obligations to other communities who perhaps are more vulnerable to exclusion than, um, than Asians, or at least a certain caste, right? Certain caste or class of Asian Americans have been lately, right? Thank you. Um, so I wanted to uh, uh, also just emphasize uh, when 
uh, uh, when Mr. Singh was talking about, um, you know, try, trying to find common ground on the other side. Um, one thing that's really I think, interesting about Thin in his life is also his religion and spirituality. So after he um, after he lost the Supreme Court case, he stayed in the U.S. Um, he uh, he had spent the next thirty years or so actually traveling around the country, giving lectures and like packed lecture halls around uh, Sikh spirituality. Um, and in fact, one I actually have some books here, <laughs> which uh, uh, Dr. Thin's son uh, David Thin was 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 so kind to to send me these books. So you can see. These are all books around, you know, kind of empowering people, thinking about, you know, what is the radiant role to reality? How do I, how do you find happiness in this life? How do you really kind of find common ground with others? And, and it's not just, you know, maybe maybe finding kind of that strength um, in spirituality. So, so in that, you know, in that vein, um, you know, one of the things he said uh, in one of his books is that, like, you know, he envisions a society which which with, with, without any routine or superstition, with, with, with no purda or caste, no paria, pariahs, no injustices. So I'm really curious, you know, starting with you, Mr. Atarimala, how do you, how does your, um, your own faith kind of inform um, what you're fighting for? And what role do you think religion or spirituality has in, you know, um, this kind of activism or making the world a better place? I think it's similar to the stories that were shared earlier by Mr. Singh and Professor Manshi. Um, you know, we're often expected to be the role models in these professions, right? A lot of us have just kind of been able to, to take advantage of the 1965 Immigration Act. And um, only recently have we been able to start breaking these ceilings. Uh, you know, to Ginger speaking at the Supreme Court, that was like a historic first for some of our communities. Um, we just recently heard of a Sikh serving on the Supreme Court as a clerk. Um, a big law, American 100 law firm, um, only within the past 20 years that we see someone attain partnership status. So in a lot of these spaces, it's new for us. But when it comes to our faith, I think um, the role of religion or spirituality in activism and advocacy can be really complex and multifaceted. On the one hand, um, religion uh, can provide a powerful source for inspiration for us, motivation and moral grounding. Um, but then we've also seen, I think, some troubling narratives around religion being used to divide communities. Um, and we've seen religion also been used as a tool to justify and perpetuate systems of uh, oppression and inequality. And that can be really problematic. But throughout history, I think um, we, we need to look back and figure out a better way. And the personal beliefs versus the institutional beliefs can sometimes diverge. Um, ultimately, the role that we take at the Sikh Coalition um, is to make sure that we do no harm to others, other communities, specifically when we're advocating for religious rights. And so we view this as a civil rights issue, not a religious rights issue. Um, and for example, when we litigate cases, we want to make sure that religious liberty arguments are not being used as a sword to discriminate against communities. Specifically, we've seen the troubling pattern of LGBTQ communities um, being disenfranchised by religion and the law. And that is not something that we think spiritually aligns with some of the faith practices for uh, the Sikh community. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of work to be done here um, on that particular issue. Okay. Um, Professor Mitch, do you have anything to add on that in terms of thinking about spirituality? Good. What about Mr. Singh? Yeah, I'll take a slightly different yeah. angle on it, which is, you know, and this is speaking mostly to the, the students here, um, you know, whether you are a religious person or not, you know, it's quite common, I think, for people to speak of, like, having a soul. Uh, and as you figure out what you want to do with your lives and your legal careers, uh, I would advise that you don't do things that crush your soul. <laughs> uh, seriously, like, you know, I, I, I encounter in my day-to-day -day tons of folks who I think are perfectly lovely human beings. And uh, what they do for a living is, like, make sure that, like, class action arbitration waivers are enforced to the fullest possible degree, right? Or, like, make sure that Exxon makes as much money as possible. Um, and then they go home and they're like, I feel like my soul has been destroyed. Um, and I'm like, yeah, well, you should maybe think about 
So your choices, and they're like, but I have law school debt. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. So anyway, you're gonna have to figure this out for yourself. But um, I will say that, like, you know, for me anyway, to the extent that uh, spirituality and, and religion and values have played a role in what I do law wise, uh, it's done a lot to shape the kind of work I like to do, the types of people I like to represent, um, and so the career that I wanted to build. Um, you know, that doesn't mean I'm standing up and like making religious arguments. I sell them in you know, every now and then I'll write an amicus brief or something, but like that's not the mainstay of my practice is religious issues. Um, you know, as I said, my principal job is to like channel the perspective of the people I'm trying to persuade. But as, a, as you try to reconcile whatever set of values you have, with what you do for a living, it's important to come up with a reconciliation that feels authentic. I feel like the people who are the saddest in the legal profession are the ones who fail that task, who, who have a really deeply uh, lovely set of values, and then who go and do work and who try to convince themselves that there's no conflict and fail. Uh, those are the ones who I find, who find themselves in crisis. So either get really good at convincing yourself that you're the good guy, you know, or actually be the good guy. Uh, those are those are that's those are the two paths to happiness in this line of work. Thank you. So I think finally we're going to uh, do some closing remarks, and then we'll have some time for a Q and A as well. Um, but I want to just get from each of you maybe just like a one minute like thing as to kind of looking forward. You know, how do we reckon this history? Kind of what's kind of the takeaway when we think about this case? How should we? Um, you know, uh, think about it. And it is then really our history, or you know, or is it more complicated than that? Um, how can we use this as you know the best way to deal with the problems we're facing today? Um, Professor Munchi, want to go first? Yeah, I thought I could give, um, as I sort of suggested, and, and I think some of my last remarks, like I think when we're thinking about how to remember a case like this, right? I think it would be a mistake um, to to use kind of victimization of thin to affirm something about a kind of like identity uh, forged through victimhood or something like that. And the part of the legacy of thin that I, I still find really exciting, right, is his own involvement with this with this other party. And, you know, maybe later in his life, he sort of shifted gears a bit, like many of his generation did, right, under the pressure of this decision. Um, but I think, you know, we can uh, look at other examples. I'm really excited by the example of, for instance, um, survivors of Japanese incarceration who draw lines of connection between their own histories of incarceration with um, other immigrant communities, right, who have been subject to family separation and child detention, uh, other indigenous communities who share that kind of history. And I think like, I would love to see South Asians also kind of making similar lines of connection across other kinds of communities. And to me, again, that's part of the legacy of Thin rather than simply the kind of inheritance of this racial um, marking or something like that. Great. Yeah, I'd actually love to build on that. Um, it's just, really interesting to see that that theme move forward I, I feel like we all don't know enough about our history and we we need to learn the thin case we need to learn that the civil rights movement actually permitted us to have the freedoms and liberties that we have today in, in order to to emigrate to the united states and that was not something that was taught by my parents and or what it be expected of them because they were immigrants they didn't know American history. And these kinds of initiatives led by Professor Munchi to teach that kind of uh, specific lessons is, is really important. But I think we, we continue to learn from the Tin case and we, we learn what doesn't work for us as a community. And I, I wanna point to the backlash attacks of 9-11. My community and many other South Asian communities, Muslim, Arabs, Hindus, and, and others, were targeted because we were perceived as terrorists for better or for worse. And that was deeply problematic. But what we learned, because we have a community that understood that that kind of, we need to stand together. And what we did at the Sikh Coalition and, and many other communities is we didn't say, you got the wrong guy. We're not the Muslim, we're not the Arab. 
That's not a framing that's correct because that implies that your hate and violence needs to go towards someone else in the United States. And that's something that I think we're building on those threads on how can we start to figure out how to like build those bonds within our own communities and even adjacent communities so that we can be stronger together rather than saying, ah, we're higher caste than you and you don't belong to be a citizen or not. And I think this history teaches us opportunities to, to overcome these challenges and find better solutions together. And you know, we have to continue to find ways to uplift some of these amazing achievements that our communities are doing as well, while also recognizing that the model minority myth also applies to us and it risks wiping out some of the marginalization systemic structures that minority communities continue to face even within our communities. People are just not advantaged or privileged or weren't lucky sometimes to get to the positions that we are in today. And so to the law students here, I would certainly say just recognize how lucky you are to be where you are today. Um, and don't take it for granted. You know, we've seen the appointment of a uh, New Jersey Attorney State General, Gurbir Grable, who's the first turban sick Attorney General in the United States for st state level. But he endured a lot of um, hate, comments, media attacks. And it just goes to show that people want to take away what we have, whether it's citizenship or personal accomplishments or achievements. And we just can't rest on our laurels. And it's a really difficult burden that we have to continue to bear. I guess the last thought I give is what, what the case draws into focus for me is, um, you know, the argument was like silly, right? Like I'm white, I found a way. Um, and the court rejected it. And I think that the idea that stands out most to me is that like, and it's it's relevant today too, depending on I suppose which side of the political spectrum you sit. You know, I I sitting sort of on the lefty side of the spectrum have never had that much confidence in the Supreme Court as sort of the place where everything's going to work out. Um, and I think that's that's sort of more obvious today than it might have been five years ago uh, or eight years ago. Um, and I think that you know eventually uh, there's there's actually a nice ish coda to the story. He does get his citizenship. Uh, he gets it in 1935 after Congress says that all World War I veterans, regardless of race, can apply. They find another way. But I think what that illustrates for me is that like, you know, if you want real changes, um, you know, sneaking under the door the way he tried to do in court this is the harder path generally. Um, the, the better, more durable path is you know, make the real change that works for everyone. And so we've heard about the Immigration Act of 65, we've heard about other things that are, are promoting uh, good outcomes across the board. Um, I think that that's really the project uh, that we ought to be focused most on. And there are certainly lots of powerful ways to work on that with a law degree. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that the courts have no role to play in this or that lawyers have no role to play. Um, but I think one of the big lessons of this case to me is that, like, uh, you know, it's it's a good illustration of how even a clever argument, you know, uh, thoughtfully presented will not necessarily get us to where we need to be. What we need to be doing is changing minds uh, about the underlying attitudes of who belongs and who doesn't. Oh, excellent point. Um, just to add to, to that, like even in 1946, was when there was a law passed which actually allowed, um, you know, Indian Americans, South Asian Americans, to actually uh, naturalize, and that was really only passed through a lot of political advocacy from folks in the U.S. But a lot of it was based on the idea that like India is becoming independent, we have to like maintain decent relations with them. I think this goes back to the anti-colonial kind of perspective, right? Uh, so. Um, when those when that anti colonial movement was able to have some level of success, that's when these all these things are kind of linked, right? When India got its independence, is when the U.S. was kind of forced to kind of change its laws as, as well. I think what's interesting about Thin is that you know later in his life too, he was he was supportive of you know these kinds of efforts. So he he helped get the the 1946 um, Act into law 
Um, and he also supported, uh, for example, the Dalip Singh Song, who ended up being the first Sikh American in the House of Representatives um, in Congress as well. So I think that's a lesson we can all learn from that today. All right. Well, thank you for talking. Um, and now we have time for a Q&A. So I think a few minutes. So anyone feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm blanking on the name of the case. I think it might have been Gong Lim, the Mississippi case dealing with school segregation. And I was wondering how um, you may, or any of you may see that as like connecting with this case in terms of Asians trying to sort themselves, figuring out how to deal with the literally black and white racial categories of America and, and where to fit themselves in. So I don't know the case, um, but I can give you a thought on the general question. Um, I think as time has gone on, it's become quite abundantly clear that, uh, you know, what was a nation of only white and black and Native American people has become more heterogeneous and that's created complications. Um, and then there's differentiation within those groups you know, as well, along lines of religion, national origin, and so on. I think the law has done an okay job evolving to sort of account for that. There are exceptions. You know, you still hear about like caste discrimination and does the law account for it? You hear about a lot about these days in like the tech industry, right? And whether it's properly dealt with by existing civil rights law. Um, there's still debates uh, that are being worked out. But I think that that will sort of be an ongoing effort. Um, but I think that for the most part, um, you know, race relations are thought of as more complex than they previously were now. Um, and so I don't perceive there to be, you know, a huge issue in terms of like, you know, I don't fit one of these two categories, therefore I don't know where I, where I am. Um, maybe Haley says that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe not true for all of us. Uh, but but that's, that's where I sort of land on that. I have a thought now about about this, you know, just having a second to think about it. I think so, you know, during these, so after then, as, as I think some of you mentioned, you know, there was a wave of denaturalization cases, right? So a number of, of, of Indians who had been granted citizenship uh, had their citizenship challenged. Um, nobody was arguing that they were Black. They could have, but nobody was arguing that. And um, in some cases that I'm familiar with, uh, individuals who were defending their citizenship uh, attempted to prove their whiteness by uh, asserting that they understood how the color line worked and they understood that anti-blackness was a criterion of citizenship, right? They, they kind of articulated that, right? And, and I think um, that's also part of the legacy of, of of this case for us, for some of us who, who claim this is, is part of like a, a, an inheritance, right? To recognize the anti-Blackness that has also shaped um, Asian identity. Um, and I think, you know, when we think about some of like what's relevant about this case now, and we have this affirmative action case, you know, the Harvard affirmative action case coming down. Again, I think like really the task for Asian American people <laughs> like us situated as we are, I think the task is to sort of really resist being situated in the way that we sometimes are cynically situated to um, discipline and devalue Black and other immigrant communities too. You know, the other thing that I don't see so much talk of now is Asian American communities, you know, as I said, and sort of like standing up to defend um, border crossers, right? And, uh, and, and others who are sometimes, who, who are really now, the the, um, um, the people who are most victimized by the 1965 Act, right? Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question is mostly about um, it, it's going to be a little vague, probably a rephrasing of something that Ashwin already asked, and I wasn't entirely sure I got like a clear or satisfactory response. So. When, when you're talking about examining um, the legacy of this person who was obviously like a complicated person and we have, you know, we have acknowledged that some of the arguments that he, that he made would sort of be problematic in today's context. But, you know, a lot of those arguments continue to be made in India today where, you know, lower caste people are being lynched every day as we speak based on 
those very similar sort of arguments. And today, when we are thinking about something like the Seattle, Seattle uh, caste discrimination ban law, it's uh, there are so many groups. I mean, I know that several of you are associated with groups that supported that, but there are several Asian American and Asian groups that that are sort of like, no, you should not have this. Like, this is not like this is like anti Asian or whatever. So I feel like when we are talking about the legacy, if we are talking about it in like overwhelmingly positive terms, aren't we sort of whitewashing all of these things and like, like it, it, it's not a story of just um, here's this incredibly interesting person who sort of tried to sneak in through the door. It's also like a story of someone who created this like, I mean, he didn't personally create it, but you know what I mean? Like there is like this entire chain of logic that till today continues to oppress people. And unless we take more ownership of that and maybe even denounce some parts of this legacy, how are we going to like, how, how is this like going to be, how is this tying? I don't know if that question made any sense, sorry. I feel like I'm questioning the whole point of this panel, but yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I have I have thoughts about this. I mean, I don't think any of us are, of are course, yeah. yeah, are are um, you know, in fully embrace this character. And to be, you know, I mentioned this in a correspondence today. I think the the hundred year anniversary is of the case, right? Mm -hmm. I think we can distinguish between thinned man and thinned, you know, yeah. with italics and the and the case and what that case sort of represents, right? And I do agree with you, especially for like Indian Americans of the U.S. I think it's really important to sort of think about our relationship to this history, right? And and to me, it's not, you know, there is no direct line of inheritance. Is part of what I'm trying to suggest, especially those of us who are the beneficiaries of an immigration system, the, the 1965 immigration system, which I don't think is itself a thing I'm to celebrate, right? I think part of what what the, that act is remembered for is abolishing a racial bar to citizenship, abolishing you know the kind of like anti-Asian bar, but it also set in place um, you know criteria like select you know um, preference categories that have favored high skill workers, right? And as you know, you know, there is no community of immigrants that has been more shaped by the immigration policy, right? And the economic and geopolitical imperatives reflected in the immigration policy. So right now, something like 80% of the H-1B visas that are awarded to anyone in the world go to Indians, not South Asians, right? Indians. And so this immigration law has created a very specific demographic. It's pretty astonishing. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting that we don't reflect upon it more. It can be a little conservative. The politics of that or of that um, you know, demographic um, can sometimes align with some of the, you know, the worst of what's happening, you know, in you know, India at the moment, right? And I think that there is a responsibility that we have then to sort of also be aware of this, right? The way in which we have been partly kind of like a demographic created by this immigration system and then the obligations that we might have as part of this diaspora. I don't know if that's responsive, completely responsive, but it's a great, it's a great question. But do you have more thoughts about it? Nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw, I just saw a grimace. So that's what I was, I was trying to, to, to figure out what, if there was something more there. I think left stay time for one more question. Ramon, do you want to go? Yeah. Um, so, so if we go back a hundred years and change the ruling and say that, but let's say then wins, that, that he's like officially a white man and he can enter American society freely as a white man, would that truly have been victorious for South Asians? Like, like what impact would that have had? Would it would have would, would that impact be temporary, especially under an intersectional lens when you kind of take in classism and elitism, especially within the Asian community. Um, because in my perspective, Bajit Singh Bain was an incredible person, but he also wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't from like a low um, caste. He was a high Brahmin, you know, he, he, he came to the US, he was able to immigrate, he was able to assimilate into American culture. So if we go back in time 100 years and actually change the ruling in his favor, what impact would that have had? And would that have been any meaningful or, or in any sense or any thoughts on that? Yeah, 
I, I don't think that would have been a good outcome for the South Asian community broadly, because correctly, like you identified, his argument was based on his caste. So now you're splitting hairs between what Indians are considered white and which ones are not. And so that becomes a really interesting argument where, you know, the Supreme Court is going to, or many courts across the country would have to start determining what caste you belong to, and then do you qualify as white or not? Um, I think that you would have really unequal outcomes, and I don't know if that would even be sustainable, but also just like looking at like the political context in the environment, the social environment that he was in at the time, post-World War I, the United States started to wall itself off. It didn't want to accept foreigners of a certain type. So I think even if you were to see that kind of decision, there probably would have been legislation to start undoing that in some meaningful way, maybe more explicitly say, well, we don't want these kinds of people in our country. I mean, that's my imagination of like a revisionist history, if that were to, to unfold, but I don't think that would have been a sustainable precedent to, to manage um, because now you're just differentiating between specific kinds of Indians who are allowed to be considered Aryan or, or high caste white. I don't know, it's a hard call, right? Because the counterfactual piece of it is tricky. You have to do a lot of imagining and see you know, how do all the pieces come together. But I think what your question raises is kind of the basic argument of like, if you can't get perfect justice, do you want any benefit? Or do you want to just forego any benefit in the pursuit of perfect justice? And I, my own view of it is that like, from a practical standpoint, the typical approach, especially for an attorney representing a client is you take what's offered. Right, you get the best thing you can for your client if you're a lawyer. Right now, as someone who's not in that role, right, if you're doing your own advocacy or thinking about what a good society looks like, you don't have an obligation to a client. You should feel free to see it very differently. Um, so I think like a lot turns on the lens you bring to it, but that does seem to be the basic question you're asking. Right, is like if this guy could have gotten his citizenship and as a result had a situation where you wouldn't have a wave of denaturalization proceedings against a couple of, you know, a few dozen other people immediately, and then there were a couple thousand affected down the line, right? Would that be worth it um, to enshrine a precedent that basically says this guy gets to stay because he's white, right? Which you regard as like an off-putting uh, line of reasoning. It's almost impossible to weigh it in any coherent way. And so at the end, I think it comes down to like what feels good in your soul about it. Uh, but I will say in the real world, what tends to happen is compromises get made at some point, right? I'm unaware of uh, I'm unaware of progress being made in sweeping and uh, bold terms that everyone is always happy with everything. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for your questions and let's give all, all the panelists a, a, a round of applause. <laughs>